Our next question comes from Maddie out of Beaufort, South Carolina, and she writes, I often hear you talk about how we are free moral agents. I wanted to know what your biblical basis was for this. Well, again, everything is defined. What do I mean by a free moral agent? I'm saying that you have a free will that certainly needs to be uh, supported by the living God uh, in the sense that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. And so if a man is dead in his sin, then he has no capacity in and of himself to be able to respond to the living God unless God somehow works in his life. And so in John 6, Jesus can say, no one can come to the Father unless the Father first draws him. And so it's not man coming after God, it's God coming after man. Even when Adam and Eve sinned, they don't come running back to God and say, oh God, we blew it, we shouldn't have done this, we're so sorry. It is the living God coming after man And he asks the question, where are you, Adam? Uh, I think someone wrote in about that recently. No need to answer that question because I'm going to answer it now. And whenever you hear the voice of God asking a question, and their question is, why does God ask a question if God's omniscient? And the answer is he is omniscient, and he never asks questions to learn. He only asks questions to reveal. And so in every instance in the Bible, when you hear God asking a question, the voice of God in the first person, it's only to reveal, and he's revealing to Adam and Eve that there's a deep problem. And so it's not Adam running back to God. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. So God comes running after man. God loves man even in his fallen sinful state and seeks out Adam and Eve that they might be forgiven. And he does the same for you. If when Paul summarizes the fallen nature of man in Romans 3, it's what we often refer to as the doctrine of total depravity. Uh, total depravity, it, again, it can be defined differently by, by a different theological camps. But generally speaking, what is agreed upon, it's not that man is as bad as he can be, but man is as bad off as he can be. It's not that man isn't good, but that he's not as good as he should be. It's not that he can't do good. He's admonished to do good. But in the truest sense, there is no one good, Jesus said to the rich young ruler, except God alone, actually giving an affirmation for his own deity. And so God has to predispose our will. Now, in the Calvinistic camp, he'll say they will argue that God only predisposes the will of the elect whom he chose before the foundation of the world and the rest are left in their sin, justly so, it's argued, and left to perish. And I would say, no, God actually works in the heart of every man. He gives general revelation. The heavens are declaring the glory of God, the psalmist writes. Paul says in Romans 1 that God has revealed his eternal attributes, his divine nature, and power through the things he has created. He's given man a conscience within in Romans 2.15. So God has through creation, through conscience, and even care, as Jesus affirms on the Sermon on the Mount, he causes his rain and his sun to shine on both the righteous and the unrighteous. So God reveals himself to man in that respect, and light responded to brings more light. And so when a man responds to the light he has, God gives more information about himself. But again, it's God seeking after man. If God didn't shout from the heavens his existence, if God didn't uh, soften a man's heart, because as Luther said, the, the, the will is in bondage. Now, Luther, I think, had some strange ways of thinking as to how the will was uh, released. He argued that in infant baptism, it was released. And we would simply say, as most biblicists would today, of course, Luther is coming out of Catholicism, and he, he uh, stays with a lot of Roman Catholic doctrines in a number of places, but we're grateful for those doctrines that he did reject, especially as it related to our salvation by grace alone through faith alone. But we would say, no, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, He convicts the world, and the world means world. It doesn't mean elect. He convicts everyone of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's God seeking after man. But then once he does that, 
you have a free will to say yes or no. The Calvinists would say, you only said yes to God because he first said yes to you. The Arminian would say, God doesn't have to do anything. There's a spark of goodness left in you where you can respond all by yourself to the living God. That's not accurate either. I would say that I'm a Calvinian and that, no, God must make the first move, but he doesn't do that with a select few. He does it with everyone. And then as a free moral agent, you can say yes to Christ or you can say no to Christ. The scripture teaches the doctrine of election. Every biblically based Christian believes in that doctrine. That's not what is at question. What's at question is how does God elect? And the word prognosco means before knowledge. In fact, it's used in other places in the New Testament that have absolutely nothing to do with salvation, but just of something that was known ahead of time. And so God can write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life before the world was ever even created because he's an omniscient God. He knew what man was going to do, and he knew how each and every individual would respond to his general or specific revelation. Those who would say, yes, he wrote their name down in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. You know, we used to sing a song when I was a new Christian, there's a new name written down in glory, and that's really not accurate. The names are written down before the foundation of the world. Does that change your free will? No, not at all. God just knew. You say it's not what God foreknew, it's whom he foreknew. Yes, whom he foreknew based on what he foreknew. And you can play word games, but look at the word proganosco in either noun or in a verbal form. It always simply means knowledge that was known ahead of time. And so based on that as an omniscient God, without violating your free will, without making you a robot, as a free moral agent, if you've said yes to Christ, you can't brag on yourself because the initiative didn't begin with you, it began with God. And this is why there is a sense of urgency when it comes to responding to the gospel. Because the scripture says, today is the day of salvation. When you hear his voice, not literally like a voice from heaven, but his message, you could say, don't harden your heart. Because if it begins with God and you put God off long enough, he will ultimately give you your wish. And that's one of the points of John chapter 12. Though Jesus had done all kinds of miracles in their presence, they still didn't respond. And then he gives an exhortation, listen, while the light is among you, respond that you might become sons of light. But to these who habitually rejected all the evidences that he gave, he fulfilled the specific miracles that were unique to the Messiah. He went on to say, because they would not respond, they could not respond. Why? Because he, he, who, he, God, hardened their heart. He, God, blinded their eyes. He, God, stopped their ears that they would not and could not believe and be saved. And so God is the first mover, but he gives you a free will but you would be wise to fear the living God and not to kick the can down the road because there'll come a time when that initiative with God will stop. Good question. Let's go to the next. Dr. Carl Brogy answers your questions about the Bible and living the Christian life Tuesday mornings at 11 on The Light, 88.7 FM and online around the world at wagp.net. 